So welcome to our first lecture uh, it's, uh, on the conjugated dynes and UV spectroscopy. Um, realize that uh, we will cover chapter 16 of the Smith book and also um, the a small portion of chapter 30, which I'll point out to you uh, in the coming week. Um, you should realize by now that a series of these lectures will be um, given to you and, and of course we expect you to uh, watch them and it is to compensate for uh, quite a bit of offline activities. So um, let's have a look. Uh, we have here uh, the conjugated dienes. Now the conjugated dienes are really a type of alkene. So really it's like a super alkene chemistry. You should realize that or we're looking at the classes and stability of these dyes. We're going to look at the synthesis. And of course, like alkenes, we will look at electrophilic addition to them. Remind yourself that addition is the removal of a degree of unsaturation. Uh, we'll be looking at thermo and the kinetics of this. We'll move deeper into the linear combination of atomic orbitals and then um, further our knowledge on uh, these conjugated dyes when we start to look at pericyclic reactions. Among the pericyclics, we'll be looking at cycloadditions and electrocyclic reactions. We won't be covering sigma tropics. And then I'll top it off with some UV vis. So let's have a look at what exactly we're we talking about. In the past, you've looked at resonance. Resonance really is telling you that you have at least three p orbitals perpendicular to the to a plane of molecules or a plane of carbon atoms. Even. So here, for example, these are the simplest species that you can have where we have a conjugated system, where we have resonance. Uh, we have an allylic system. Now, of course, the allylic system can be a radical. Uh, it could be a cation or an anion. I personally will be just briefly looking at heterolytic systems. Yeah, so uh, we'll be looking at both the cationic species and the elytic species. Uh, you can see there's uh, other examples of this conjugation. So classically, the one we focus on the most are these conjugate dienes. But of course, you can see here we have these two double bonds here in conjugation and this is not a C double bond C, it is a C double bond O. Here we have an alkyne conjugated to an alkene, but it's the same principle. It's a principle of free uh, P orbital perpendicular to the plane of the molecule. So here are some categories of dyes that you should remember um, exist. Um, we have the cumulative system, you can see that in center here we have an SP hybrid carbon this is quite a high energy system it's not very stable here we have a conjugated system which is very stable and here we have an isolated system what we mean by isolated is that you can see that these two double bonds are isolated from each other they are not conjugated so on closer expansion you can see that this sp3 hybridized carbon yes separates out these p orbitals that are perpendicular to uh, the plane of the molecule here and of the molecules here. So if we look at the p orbitals themselves, you can see that this is the case of the isolated system and here is the sp3 carbon. Yeah, so all the p orbitals are used up in the hybridization and so never the twain shall meet. So these two double bonds one, two, will not be conjugated. Here, however, you can see that all of these guys are adjacent to each other, perpendicular to the plane of the molecule, and therefore we have conjugation. We'll actually be looking quite a bit at these one, three, five systems in the near uh, future. So let's move on. There is a uh, quite a wealth of conjugated uh, organics. Uh, you can see that here, for example, we have the cyclopentadiene, and these two double bonds are 
conjugated, similar to uh, the one three pentadiene. On closer inspection, you can see that here in this benzene ring, we have all of these three double bonds conjugated. But look, it is isolated from this fella, from this double bond. Here we have a ring, three double bonds, and it's conjugated to this. And then of course, it's conjugated to this ring as well. On the other hand, when you look over here, you can see that in this 1,2-diphenyl ethane, you can see that there's a benzene ring here, but it's isolated from this benzene ring. It doesn't have to be a carbon-carbon bond because you can see with the azos why this double bond here is conjugated to this system and this system. So this whole system is conjugated. And we will have a closer inspection of species like this in the in the near future. Um, we can ask a question like this. It asks you which compound does not have a conjugated system? Immediately you realize that every single compound except for C yeah, has the double bond conjugated. Here C is showing you an isolated system. Here's the sp3 carbon, and that double bond is therefore isolated away from that double bond. Certain features that are evident in uh, these um, conjugated systems is the short distances of the C to C3 bond. It's a very short bond, yeah, compared to a normal carbon carbon single bond. This is the bond length of 1,3-butadiene. On closer inspection, what we've noticed, yeah, so it's 1.47. Here, the alkene, of course, quite short, 1.34. In a regular alkene, yeah, the carbon car alkane, the carbon carbon is at 1.54 Armstrongs. So you can see there's a difference of 0 0.07 Armstrongs. Yeah? The argument is that, of course, there's sp3, sp3 overlap, and of course, with the p contribution uh, being so um, strong, then of course, the overlap is not as great. On the other hand, you can see here, if we have in this um, one, two, three, four, this one butene, you can see that we have an sp2 overlapping with an sp3, so we expect overlap to be a bit better, hence the shorter bonds. And of course, yeah, you'd expect there to be an even greater shortening here when you have the, the alkyne. So with the sp, sp3 overlap. So this phenomenon can easily be explained by the hybridization of the carbon. So we say sp2, sp2 overlap, yeah, it's quite efficient, and hence you get a 1.47 Armstrong. Personally, I prefer the molecular orbital treatise of this, and we will have a look at that later. It's much more elegant. So we move on. Um, we also look at the relative stabilities, like all um, the type of alkene chemistry. We have to look at the stabilities, and how we do that, we just hydrogenate. So in this case, hydrogenation yeah, um, realizes the parent alkane. Yeah, so you remove all uh, the double bonds or triple bonds that you have in your compound yeah, to give you an alkane. You can see quite simply put, if we look at a simple picture here, two of these one butenes, that means two double bonds in the same sort of environment as this 1,3-butadiene, yeah, two of them is equivalent, yeah, will give off 254 uh, kilojoules of mole when I hydrogenate. However, when I hydrogenate the conjugated system, I only generate 239 kilojoules per mole of energy. That's a difference of 15 kilojoules per mole. This is called yeah, the resonance stabilization energy, yeah, 
or the energy saved due to conjugation. We can see quite a few examples of different unsaturated species and you can see that the conjugated system has the yeah generates the least amount of energy when we hydrogenate meaning that it is the lowest energy system the most stable system and so we can ask something like this uh, immediately here what you would want to do is you want to draw the compound in each case and then you try to analyze these um, figures and see which one yeah um, is the one that will give you the smallest heat of hydrogenation and here I will pause for a sec for you to work this out immediately you can see that this is the conjugated system this is an isolated system this is a simple alkyne and this one of course is a cumulative system so uh one question i could ask quite easily is give us the order of stability now that will be an interesting question to put on the exam synthesizing these um conjugated dienes is quite simple yeah you can see that we can have this elytic bromine compound so you can have an elytic system and brominated with say for example NBS and then we use the tert oxide to eliminate yes and that will generate our conjugated system you can see that uh, we also can use a dibromo species like this and we use the tert oxide and of course it will eliminate across here and here Yes, to give us our conjugated system. You can envisage, right, you have a double bond in here and then you treat it with dibromine to give you this dibromo species. The question I should ask you is what would happen if we have a less steric base such as this uh, ethoxide? Here is a typical example of the synthesis. You can see that we have the alkene. We treat it with the n bromosuccinamide. Remember that this occurs by a radical mechanism. And then, of course, you've got the bromination. Elimination with the, the uh, butoxide realizes your conjugated system. And so we go to the main thrust of this section, and that is the electrophilic addition to dienes. Namely, electrophilic addition to conjugate dyes. I just want to briefly look at the elytic cation, and then there is a section on the resonance. I'll give you that in the handout, so I'll expect you to review that. In the meantime, I'm going to go through, yeah, continue and talk about uh, the mechanism of this addition and the two possible products, i.e., that which is of kinetic control and that which is of the thermodynamic control. So I personally recommend you to go through the slides, upcoming slides on resonance, and then uh, you can get back to this part of the lecture. Remind yourself that resonance is of course, yeah, there is no change in the skeleton structure yeah, just movement of lone pairs and pi electrons. So in this case here, we have a cation. We move that lone pair into that space because these three carbons here are the ones that are in resonance because those are the ones with the p orbital perpendicular to the plane. Yeah. On the other hand, you can see that here we have a uh, species, right? And we have... Uh, this looks like a hydride shift. Yeah, this is not a resonant structure of the other because you move some sigma bonds. You can see here, for example, yeah, another case where we have something weird because you push the electrons into there, but now you have a ten-electron carbon, pentabenic carbon, and that's not good either.
see? So work on those and we'll, yeah, we can continue this part of the lecture. So I'll pause here. We need to also observe carbocation stability. We've learned this from some time ago. Whereas you can see that the tertiary carbocation is quite stable compared to say the secondary and the primary. Uh, the stability of course by a hyperconjugation. Here you have an allylic cation and of course it's stabilized by resonance and this is very good but of course this is an allylic cation which has a primary carbon carbon cation in this position on the other hand you can see that here we have the most stable beast of all because we have an allylic species but not only that the carbon associated with this allylic species this carbon cation is tertiary so it's a combination of analytic system and hyperconjugation or robust hyperconjugation so these are very stable species we could easily ask something like this which alkene is least reactive in an acid catalyzed hydration in a case like this what you really want to know is which compound yeah produces uh, the least stable carbon cation. Have a think about that and we can come and talk about it the next time we meet during our discussion. So I'll pause right here. So here and we're talking about the electrophilic attack on conjugated dienes uh, to produce the 1, 2 and 1, 4 addition. We find that at very low temperatures at very low temperatures yeah when we have a conjugated dime with an electrophile we have the one two product the one two adduct dominating assuming that this is carbon one this is carbon two carbon three carbon four one two three four at high temperatures then we have the one four adduct dominating this is thermodynamic control remind yourself of this when you do attack a alkene to generate a carbon cation you really want the Markovnikov carbon cation this is no different but here we have a conjugated system why so what we're going to try to do is try to open up the conjugate system so that we have the most stable carbon cation. That carbon cation of course has to be allylic. Have a think. So this allylic system will generate your kinetically produced product. So you can see that here at low temperatures this is the kinetic spe species and of course at high temperatures we end up with your kinetic species being very low and the thermodynamic species very high. Look at the difference because the kinetic species is the least substituted alkene. There's only one al R group on the alkene at present. On the other hand you can see that the thermodynamic species has is disubstituted in this case. The mechanism looks like this. Opening up with the HBr is typical, yeah, you have the HBr, you have nucleophilic attack on the electrophilic hydrogen bromide. This, of course, hydrogen is the electrophilic center. And you end up with a carbon cation. There should be a plus here, by the way. I should really fix that. So this is a carbon cation right here. And here we have a carbon cation as well. You can see that this fella is a resonance structure of that guy. 
So, extraordinarily, we have the bromine attacking both species. And of course, if we, in this case, here, yeah, we end up with the 1, 2. And in the second case, we end up with the 1, 4. The 1, 2, of course, is the kinetic species. And the 1, 4 is our thermodynamic species. This is a quite a simple question because I'm asking you which compound could react with the DCL to produce this uh, compound shown. We have four options. Now, what I would like you to do is have a little think. Yeah, I'll pause it right here. You should pause as well. Have a little think and think about yeah, which product is uh, which compound was the likely starting material? Did you pause? I hope you did. If we look at the energies involved in this uh, mechanism, yeah, you can see that the two products, yeah, the one two and the one four. Yeah, have different energies because the 1,4 is of course a disubstituted alkene so it would be of lower energy than the 1,2 on the other hand because we're going via a more stable carbocation then of course this transition state dominates over this one and so it is of lower energy i.e. the activation energy in this case is much lower so at low temperatures that's why this dominates low temperature follow the graph here yeah a low temperature sorry about that let's get rid of that At low temperatures, you can see that, yeah, we end up with this dominating. And of course, a high temperature, yeah, we have this dominating. Here's a question you can ask yourself. And you can see, of course, it's obvious that the 1, 2 is the kinetic and the 1, 4 is the thermodynamic. We don't have to use some hydrogen halide. You can see that here, for example, we have a, a dibromine. And dibromine uh, can give you the 1 to add it or the 1 4, depending, of course, on the conditions. We also have this interesting species because this is isoprene. Yeah? And of course, isoprene is the monomer for rubber. Yeah? Now you think about it for a second this polymer is a product of 1,4 addition 1,4 addition is of course yeah thermal it's like high energy you need a lot of heat yes high temperature yeah Why don't you give us a mechanism for this? We can maybe work on it next time we meet. And so I want to talk about the linear combination of atomic orbitals. It's okay because all I'm going to do is review molecular orbital theory. And then, of course, we can see how this theory uh, strongly supports uh, the bond length observed in a conjugated butadiene. We'll also briefly look at frontier molecular orbitals and then we'll look at thermal systems versus photochemical systems. So here is a brief uh, look at molecular orbitals. So for example, the simplest you can think about as far as the pi system is concerned, pi one is concerned, is of course you have two p orbitals overlapping in a plane.
You can either have them overlapping, yeah, where the bonding is, of course, the same flavor, i.e. the phases are reacting. You can see blue with blue, red with red, yes. We, 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 and then, of course, you can see that we can have them where the flavors oppose each other or the colors oppose each other or the signs oppose each other. This is, of course, constructive bonding, and that would give you bonding orbital, a bonding orbital, complete overlap. This, of course, is destructive bonding, and that will generate a molecular orbital of higher energy called the anti-bonding molecular orbital. Two p orbitals combined at this energy level, yes, and we generated two molecular orbitals of equal but opposite energy. So this one is a molecular orbital that's stabilized and this one is destabilized. When you add them together, you still get the two, the energy of the two orbitals that you start with in the first place. So two atomic orbitals combined to give you two molecular orbitals, psi one and psi two. And here we have a little star so this is site to star to indicate that this molecular orbital is anti-bonding. Realize that each in the pi bond, each p orbital will have one electron. And so in this molecular orbital picture, we have two electrons. And of course, once you fit them in according to Aufbau and Hans rule, then of course you can see that we have one pair of electrons here and zero here. The bond order, remind ourselves, the bond order of this species equals to the bonding pairs minus the anti-bonding, I'm just going to shorten this if you don't mind, anti-bonding pairs divided by 2. So in this case here we have two bonding, that's these two here, that's this two here, minus 0 anti-bonding here divided by 2 equals to 1. So the bond order is 1. And of course it is because the bond order of one pi bond is of course 1. There's only one pi bond. Here in the allylic system, it's very interesting because, yeah, why not? Yes, the allylic system, you can see that we have yeah, three p orbitals and you have a bonding psi 1, a non-bonding psi 2, and an anti-bonding psi 3 star. So if you look, say, for example, at the allylic anion, you can see the bond order is 2 minus 0 divided by 2 equals to 1. Remember that this p is represented here. It's non-bonding. Here is our butadiene. It's very pretty. You can see that we have four p orbitals combined together. Four p orbitals combined together to give you four molecular orbitals. Psi 1, Psi 2, Psi 3, and Psi 4. Psi 1 and Psi 2 are bonding molecular orbitals and Psi 2 and Psi 4, Psi 3 star and Psi 4 star are anti-bonding molecular orbitals. Look at it carefully because there's a couple of things that I needed to make notes of. If you note in Psi 1, at no time does the flavors change. Yeah, a 
above, below the plane, right? So there's zero nodes. Here, you can see there's a change in flavor right here. Yeah, it's a wave function, remember that. So the change in flavor, there's one node. Yeah, the flavor here, it's green or whatever, and here it's green. So there's change in flavor right there, one node. And of course, two nodes. So psi one, zero nodes, psi two, one node, psi three, two nodes, etc. The more nodes you have, the higher the energy. So increasing the nodes increases your energy. Remember that. Bundle order, of course, is four minus zero, four bonding minus zero anti-bonding divided by two equals to two, i.e. it is the conjugated diene and there's two pi bonds. Remind yourself that these molecular orbitals only represent the pi bonding in this molecule. Four p orbitals combined together to give you four molecular orbitals. The interesting thing about the work that we'll be doing throughout this chapter is this idea of the frontier molecular orbitals. Look at it carefully because in all of the pericyclic reactions that we'll be working with, these are the only molecular orbitals that's going to be important to us. The highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. The highest occupied molecular orbital, obviously, is in this case occupied by this pair of electrons. The lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals unoccupied of course meaning that it is got no electrons this is your band gap that energy gap there we'll look at it in uv later on that energy gap yeah falls in the uv visible and so we'll probe this later when we look at UV vis spectroscopy. One feature that, another feature I want to point out to you is this. If you look carefully at these, the Psi 1, look, here we have a blue, here we have this P orbital here, that end it's blue, here we have it's red, and over here it's red. So on both ends, on both ends, we have the same flavor, the same color. We say that this molecule orbital, this molecular orbital is symmetrical. On the other hand, if you look at Psi 2, you can see that here we have red, and over here we have blue. Here we have a red. You can see this one, of course, is blue at that end. So this molecular orbital is asymmetrical. Terribly important. Yeah, you can see that we're in from the symmetrical to asymmetrical to symmetrical to asymmetrical. Yeah. Later on, we'll be talking about um, the importance of these uh, ideas. Frontier molecular orbitals. If we hit the molecule with a photon of light equivalent to this energy then of course we will excite that molecule we will excite a pair of electrons this pair of electrons will excite an electron from this molecule orbital up to here and this is what we have right now. So what happens then? 
when we hit this with light, we end up with this situation where psi 3 is now the highest occupied molecule of the tool and psi 4 is the lowest unoccupied molecule of the tool. So we can ask a simple question like this, what type of system is this representing? And of course you can see we have a single occupied psi 3 and so that has to be photochemical because it's an excited system. Here, molecular orbital theory has an elegant way to explain the bond length of the C to C three in the conjugated butadiene. One, two, three, four. So we're talking about a C two C three bond. Yeah, it's quite simple because if you look at psi one, yeah, here. Yeah, there's a pair of electrons that reside in it, meaning that there is pi bonding between C2 and C3. Is it? There is overlap between those, yeah. So there is, because there's overlap, then of course there is pi bonding between C2 and C3. It's not shown in the Lewis structure. Is it? That's shown as a single bond, but from the molecular orbital treatise, we can see there's pi bond, and if there's pi bond, then of course the bond is shorter. Here we're looking at the conjugated triene, in this case of 135 triene, and of course we can see that in this case, if we, yeah, psi 3 is the homo, and the ground state is psi, in the ground state, the LUMO is psi 4 star, but if we excite the molecule yeah, with light, then of course the excited state is now psi, the excited HOMO is now psi 4 star, and the LUMO is psi 5 star. So that's a change in your frontier molecule orbitals on excitation. So I expect to take a break now and we'll continue with this lecture uh, in a few moments. So here uh, we'll have the coverage of pericyclics. There are some uh, parts in uh, chapter 16 and there's a small amount of uh, electrocyclics that is present in chapter 30. Um, we'll be mainly concerned with cycloadditions and electrocyclics and molecular orbital treaties of both uh, situations. Uh, you should see that pericyclics are unlike what we've done in the past in the sense that we've done homolytic which is radical systems or heterolytic systems you know where you have some sort of charge transfer. In this case here we have a cyclic transition state so it's a concerted reaction and of course it can be either thermal or excited and as we know, um, when we go through a transition state, what we're trying to do is we're trying to avoid intermediate. So intermediate is skipped and we have a transition. This is a one step concerted reaction. The three categories that we uh, should focus on are those of cycloaddition, electrocyclics and sigmatropic rearrangements. Cycloadditions, as you can see, yeah, we started off with three, in this case, we started off with three degrees of unsaturation, two here and one there, and we end up with two degrees of unsaturation, one degree in the ring and one as a double bond. And so we've lost a degree of unsaturation, hence it is an addition reaction. So what? The product has two fewer pi bonds than the reactant. In electrocyclics, in, you can see that we have, in this case, a ring opening. We started off with three degrees of unsaturation. Now we have a species with two double bonds 
and a wing and so literally we still do have three degrees of unsaturation however we've lost one degree of unsaturation to a sigma bond so we now have a new sigma bond the reverse of this will be the ring opening where we gain this uh, pi and lost a sigma so we lost the pi gained the sigma and the reverse is losing the sigma and gaining the pi sigma tropic rearrangement exactly what it is right you can see that we've rearranged the species so I can ask questions like this which of the following is classified as an electrocyclic and remember now that electrocyclic whether it's a ring opening or ring closing there shouldn't be any change in the degree of unsaturation so what I'm going to ask you to do is pause and then we'll look at this during class here we have a situation where we're asking which one is sigmatropic sigmatropic is kind of easy to recognize because then in this case here all it is is a rearrangement that's the rearrangement so the first case that we'll be focused on is a cycle addition the most important case yeah it's covered quite extensively in the literature and remind yourself that cycle addition is that each reactant will lose a pi bond and the resulting cyclic compound yeah has two new sigma bonds the two situations we're looking at is of course the diazolda which is a 4 pi 2 pi meaning you got 4 pi electrons and 2 pi electrons yeah involved and of course we have a photochemical situation where we have the 2 pi 2 pi so the diazolda is thermal and this fella here is of course the photochemical the 2 pi 2 pi let's have a look, closer look in the diazolda we say we have a thermal 4 pi 2 pi because the it is a ground state molecule or ground state molecules that will be reacting yeah uh, we're going to cover the thermodynamics uh, some kinetics and we're going to look at this some stereo specificity and the molecular orbital treaties what we've noticed is this we have a diene which has four pi electrons of course it's a conjugated diene will react with a dienophile diene lover and yeah so that's got two pi electrons and the result of this diazolda is a cyclohexene ring a cyclohexene ring we started off with three degrees of unsaturation and now we have two degrees of unsaturation hence an addition Woodward and Hoffman are the first guys that came up with this lot all the guys that are sort of like reported it in the early stages and you can see the 4 pi 2 pi to give it the cyclohexene the mechanism is kind of easy you show a concerted movement of the electrons so here we have the two new pi bonds being um, two new sigma bonds sorry being formed and here we have some pi bonds being broken so here are the new sigma bonds and here is a new pi bond of course it is a cycle addition have a look at that answer the question and we'll probe it when we come back so i would expect you to pause here as well and try to elucidate an answer This is the energy diagram involved in uh, the Diazolda. So the diene and the dienophile are reacting. And if you look, we're looking at free energy here and you can see that the reaction being spontaneous is exogenic. Passing through the cyclic transition state. Now, what I want you to remind yourself is that it is exogenic because yeah, the enthalpic content of this reaction is quite high because we went from high energy pi system to low energy sigma so here you can see that we got three pi bonds being broken and what we end up with is lower energy sigmas 
and only one new pi bond. So of course it is, yeah, it is uh, pumping out a lot of energy, i.e. it is exothermic. So this term, this term here is quite high because it's exothermic, yeah. However, what we found is that if we heat this thing greater than 200 degrees Celsius, this cyclohexene ring, we have what's called a retro diazole that, that takes place. And for us to understand exactly what's going on, we have to probe this free energy equation a bit deeper. You should realize that this minus T delta S term is positive. So if you note the delta S is positive, um, is negative because you can see there is a reduction in entropy. Yeah, two molecules going into one. So that's why this is positive. If we increase this temperature, then of course this entropic term will now overwhelm this enthalpic term and this will now be positive. If this is positive, then that means it's non-spontaneous. Non-spontaneity means that we have the reverse reaction. Remember, the forward reaction is spontaneity, yeah, all right, and non-spontaneity is, of course, the reverse. In the kinetics, we really need to probe the stereochemical requirements of the diazolda because here we need an S-cis confirmation compared to an S-trans. All it is is that in the S-cis, we have a sigma bond with both double bonds on the same side in the confirm bond. Yeah? In this case, in the S-trans, we have the double bonds on opposite side of that sigma bond here. For the diazolder to occur, we have to have an S-trans conformation. So here, for example, you can see we have a conjugated diene. And this reaction will not work because we're trapped in an S-trans. This conjugated diene is trapped in an S-trans. On the other hand, cyclopentadiene is so reactive that one molecule will act as a dienophile and then the other molecule will act as a diene and so the diazolder will happen yeah so the species dimerize we could ask a simple question like this and further uh, analysis of it you can see that yeah that this number one is trapped in the s trans can you see that? Every other molecule yeah, is trapped in the, is either trapped in the S cis, this one is trapped in the S cis, so this is really the fastest. And then, of course, we can rotate around here to give us the S cis, rotate around here to give us the S cis conformal. Substitution on the dienophile. It's terribly important. You can see that we need an electron withdrawing group on this. And so here, for example, we can see we have, yeah, sort of a conjugated uh, uh, species, which is, uh, in this case, is a enone. All of these are enones, except for this nitrile species. But you can see that here, we have an electron withdrawing group, yeah, on the dienophile. And so that will increase the speed of the reaction. In fact, you get full conversion here. You can see in this case here we have electron withdrawing groups, yeah, here and here. But here we have an electron donating group. And so this reaction is very slow. On the other hand, we have two electron withdrawing groups, and so this reaction is very fast.
one thing we note is this this terror specificity of the DSL is terribly important yeah if we have for example a dynophile where the withdrawing groups are z's yeah you can see you know, both groups are on the same side of the double bond then we end up with a cyclohexene ring where the groups are cis on the same side of the ring in the case of this fella here you can see both withdrawing groups are yeah e i.e trans and so we end up with a ring where the two groups are anti or trans to each other on the ring um, try to look at this situation and explain it for me in the in this case here the substitution on the dying yeah is what determines yeah these groups on the ring So we could easily answer a question like this and of course you can see that yeah the electron withdrawing groups on the dynophile are z's and so on the ring you'd expect them to be cis so that removes this option because you can see that here those electron withdrawing groups are trans. You should also see that here around this this species we have an E and this double bond is a Z. You can see that E so that's trans yeah and that's cis Z right here this double bond. So if you got an EZ, then of course on the diene, then of course we're going to end up with these methyl groups here and here being trans on the ring. So here we can see there are cis on the ring. So that option is out. See, cis, methyl cis on that ring. So that option is out. And so we're left with option B. That is incorrect. We're left with option B. Yeah. And lastly, we talk about the endo rule. And the endo rule is quite um, an important rule for us. All we got to remember is this, that if we have a ring system, if our dying is in a ring, then we're going to have some sort of bridget carbon if it's a five member ring we have one bridget if it's a six member ring we're going to have a double bridget uh, traditionally we use a this uh, bold line to explain to the reader that the bridget is pointing towards us yeah and so if we have any groups that are On the opposite side of the six membered ring, it will be hatch. Yeah. You can see here, this is how we represent it in a 3D structure. Realize that here is our six membered ring. Yeah. And this is the bridgehead. Any species that is opposite that bridgehead here is endo. And if it's on the same side as the ring, the six membered ring, then it's exo. So this, this group is exo, yeah, and this is endo because it's opposite the bridge head. When we have electron withdrawing groups on the dynophile, the major product is endo. And for a simple reason, the electron withdrawing group has some sort of delta plus associated with it, some sort of partial positive charge and that will interact with the electron which die in. That interaction 
once the click happens, i.e. once the two uh, sigma bonds are formed here and here, yeah, then of course the electron rejoin groups are in an endo position, not exo. So here is a simple one. Yeah, you can see immediately, yeah, that the click will not have an impact on the methoxy groups. But of course, this is what we're looking at right now, that group. And of course, you can see that it will be, yeah, it will be endo to the bridge end. This is a very nice question. Um, um, I expect you to work on that and then we will um, review that in class. This is a very nice way to reverse uh, the dissolver so we can see the starting diene and dienophile. What we gotta do is identify, first of all, the six-membered ring. So we've done it here. That's the six-membered ring, you can see, yeah? And then, of course, we draw some arrows that show bond making and bond breaking to generate our diene and our dienophile. Here you can see these two groups here were sister ring. And so in our dienophile, yeah, then, of course, they are also in that position. So this is, a, of course, a Z. In this case here, identify the ring. You can see the ring right here. Yeah. So if you identify the ring, then you can start moving some electrons around. And then, of course, you end up with your starting diene. And, of course, your diene file. Why don't you try to do this one for me? And then we'll talk about it in class discussions. So that's the end of that period. What we're going to try to do next um, is take a pause and then um, we start the next section. The next section, of course, will be uploaded as a different slide from this one. And we'll find these, similar to how you found this one, on a link, on a YouTube link.